you may, some of you will be wondering why we chose to read an, an entire chapter and four extra verses of, uh, of the Bible, but sometimes things are best not abbreviated and heard in its entirety, and certainly the creation story is one of them. Uh, there's probably not too many more poetic and beautiful ver uh, chapters in the entirety of Scripture. And so uh, certainly God creating the world in an ordered fashion, uh, putting meticulous care and thought and design in it, uh, is certainly what is reflected when we look outside at creation and see how creation exists and thrives in a way that is beyond our comprehension, and yet in a way that is within our comprehension and the mystery of that paradox. So when I, I, I would say when we look at Genesis chapter 1, we hear, when we hear the words, in the beginning, do we not think of Genesis chapter 1, the creation story? Do we not think of, uh, of it as the beginning of all things? We also think of it as the beginning of the Bible. How appropriate that the words, in the beginning, are in the beginning, right? And we also not only think of it as the beginning of the Bible, but as the oldest story found within the Bible, right? We chronologically put in the beginning at the beginning. Yet Genesis 1 is neither the oldest of the texts in the Bible, it's simply not the only creation story either. The fact of the matter is that there are two creation stories within Genesis alone. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verses 4b through chapter 4 is another separate and distinct creation story. And it happens to be the oldest of the two. So actually what happens in chapter 2, verse 4b and onward is actually older than what happens in chapter 1 through chapter 2, verses 4a. So it is the oldest story. By the way, A and B simply means you divide the verse into two sentences, and the first sentence is A and the second sentence is B. In case you were wondering where A and B exist, that's where. Um, but it, this <coughs> creation story, chronologically in the Bible, is the oldest. And it, is, it was recorded sometime during the glory golden days of the Davidic kingdom, when the, the kings that followed in succession after King David lived and thrived, and their scribes wrote down the oral traditions, this is one of those traditions. And it, its focus, it really doesn't pay attention on God going in order. It's, it's the story that we're familiar with, with regarding Adam and Eve, and the Garden of Eden, and the Tree of Life, and the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And if you remember, the story goes that, that God created this earth, and from the earth he brought man. Now, once he brought man forward, he realized there's a problem here. He's going to starve very quickly. Maybe I should put some plant life and water and other things around him so that he can live. And then he realizes that that's great, he can live, but he's alone and lonely, so maybe I should give him companion. And so out come sheep and other animals. And then God realizes that sheep and other animals are perhaps not the best companion for men. Um, all sorts of problems there. And he moves forward and decides to create a woman who is named woman because she was made from the rib of man. And so out of man came woman. And woman means out of man. Now, uh, later, uh, Adam is named Adam because he came from the earth. And Adam means earth. And Eve is named Eve because she ends up bearing Cain and Abel, and Adam saw her as the mother of all. And that's what Eve means. And so we have this story of, of Adam and Eve, and, and they, they don't listen to God, do they? God tells them not to eat from the, the tree of the fruit of the, no, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, but they do anyway, and as a result, they fall into sin. Uh, fall of being a Christian interpretation of that. But they, they end up sinning and, and being banished from the Garden of Eden. And, uh, and then what happens? Well, sin kind of takes hold, doesn't it? And Cain gets jealous with Abel, the two children from Adam and Eve, and Cain kills Abel, and 
then they have another child, Seth, and the descendants of Cain go in one direction, the descendants of uh, Abel in another, and next thing you know, you have the entire Bible outlining the woes of humanity, right? And this is kind of the, the, the uh, story, uh, and the narrative doesn't pay so much attention, as you can tell, on the ordering of creation as much as it does on humanity's need for God and ultimately their need for a king to make sure that they are held accountable to what God wants. Remember, this is written during the time of the king, so what better than a story that bolsters the need for you, right? This is what led to us needing a king. This narrative also has close parallels to creation stories of the surrounding region, such as the Mesopotamian epic of Gilgamesh, where there are close parallels. They're not exactly the same, but there are definite uh, parallels where you can see that, that, um, that the, the Jewish story, which is younger than the, the Gilgamesh story, is kind of pulling from these ancient traditions. The creation, as found in Genesis 1, on the other hand, was written somewhere during the Babylonian exile, probably in the 500 BCE, uh, where, the, if you remember, we've talked about this exile a bit, uh, the Jews had an alliance with Babylon. Basically, they were saying to Babylon, we'll pay you tribute for you not attacking us, and uh, this was a deal that Babylon set up, obviously not the Jews, but they had no choice in the matter. And the king decided to ally himself with Egypt, one of Babylon's enemies, and Babylon took that as an act of treason and marched in and destroyed Jerusalem, knocked down the temple, and took the leading priests, the scribes, the rulers, and officials, and exiled them to Babylon where they lived in captivity. They left everybody else behind. But this particular story comes out of that captivity, comes out of that exile. Um, it is written by priests and scribes who are trying to convey a very important message to the people in exile. You see, the people in exile said, well, gee, they destroyed our homeland, they destroyed our temple, they have exiled us, God's dead. Where is God? How can God be the God of the universe if, how can God be the most powerful thing that exists if the temple, the very thing that housed God, is no longer, and we're no longer in our homeland. So there was a, a faith crisis going on. And these scribes also saw that the traditions of Israel were being lost in translation. So, is their God dead too? Did Babylon prove that their God <coughs> was inferior, lost, dead? The priests wrote this creation narrative to show not only that God could not be killed, but that their God was ultimately in control. And so we have a different creation story in Genesis chapter 1, where everything is ordered by God. And there God was hovering over the spirits of the depth of, of the depths over the spirits of the waters. And God's spirit hovering over the waters, by the way, is God's spirit ho hovering over the primordial, the prim primordial uh, chaos, which in the ancient world they saw as everything outside of this ordered universe was chaos, was chaotic. And why would water be considered chaos? Can anybody think of why water would be considered chaos? Sandy. <laughs> Hurricane Sandy, amen. What's that? You can't control it. Sure, it brings life, but it brings death as well. And when you're caught out on the sea in the middle of a storm, you quickly see how chaotic the waters can become. There is no control. And so out of the chaos, out of the, out of the, the very nature of that which cannot be controlled, God brings order and life. And surely, if this God can order the chaos to life, then what can stop this God? If God can bring order from the chaos, then can't that same God bring order into the chaos that is in our lives? If God can bring order from chaos, 
cannot God bring order out of the Babylonian exile? That was the reason the scribes wrote this particular story down. This God could not be stopped by a mere mortal, such as King Nebuchadnezzar. And this God could creatively order life out of the primeval chaotic waters of the cosmos. So if that's true, this God could and would bring order and life out of the primeval chaotic waters of the Babylonian exile. What a powerful, powerful message. I can't think of a more powerful message to send to a bunch of people who literally have lost their identity and their hope. What a powerful, powerful message. <clears throat> Look at the world around you. It still seems chaotic to this day, does it not? I mean, all we have to do is turn on the news and look at the, the uh, Sunni soldiers marching into Baghdad, where we thought we put up order, right? Where we thought we ordered their civilization. All we have to do is turn on the news and see people being beheaded, people starving, people dying of uh, famine, people lost in various different ways to see the chaos that is around us. How many of you, we don't even need to turn on the TV, how many of you can look around your lives now or at any, any given point? How many of you are experience, ca experiencing chaos in your lives? How many of you feel like your life is spinning way, way out of control? The authors of Genesis 1 are telling you that God is in control. That God is, and I'll say it again, God is in control. That God can bring order to the chaos in your life. That God can bring life again to the primitive waters that are flooding your world. God's order is actively working in the world today. God's order is actively working in your world today. God the Creator is seeking to transform you into a new and living creation. God's creative work didn't end at the beginning of the world. But if we've read the Bible from front to back, we know that God's work, God's creative work is working in us today and is working in the world today and is working to recreate the world. This isn't the end chapter. We're somewhere in the process. The story hasn't ended. And through his redemptive work in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and by the power and guidance of his Holy Spirit that remains with you always, God is working in the world. All you need to do is have faith. All you need to do is have faith and trust that God is working to restore order. God's order in your life. And the beautiful thing is that once that creation springs forth in you, once that new creation is sparked in your cosmos, in your world, it doesn't stop there, but spreads forth, such as life, such as the, the wheat and the barley and the rye. When they grow, they don't stop at one stalk, but they spread and create life elsewhere. This is what we are called to do as Christians. God has harvested us as his wheat, as his rye, as his new creation. And God is scattering the seeds for others, recreating life amidst the chaos in the world, sowing hope, healing, and wholeness in the world. And if God has created you or recreated you into a new creation, 
Is he not telling you to be fruitful and multiply? We get so stuck in the literal translation of that, don't we? Be fruitful and multiply. Multiply the goodness of the creation that God is creating in you, in the lives of others. So God is speaking to you. Shh. Can you hear it? God is speaking to you. And if you listen, you will hear God's words. If you just listen, you'll hear a motorcycle. If you just listen, you will hear God's word speaking to you, speaking in you. Let there be light. Amen. Gracious and loving God, we just thank you and praise you for this message of hope. That no matter the chaos in our lives, you are with us. <clears throat> that you are never, ever failing to be with us. And that in us, you are always working toward a new creation, leading us ever forward as your wheat and your rye. As a people who are called to be fruitful, and multiply. Use us, Lord. Harvest us and scatter the seeds so that others may have the life which we have inherited through you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.